Good morning, and welcome uh, once again to our Lord's house. Uh, it doesn't seem possible this month has gone extremely fast, uh, but it's been good uh, to be with you. Uh, my wife and I have enjoyed uh, being with you again this year and pray God's blessings upon you as you uh, uh, continue in your service here at Emmanuel, and uh, we look forward to maybe seeing you again in the future. But let us rise and begin our worship. We make our beginning this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as an ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
morning. Good morning. The epistle reading is from Romans 5, chapter verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good reason one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise in honor of the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting in your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what man, what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in, the, in his glory, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise thee, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day.
words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I'd like you to do something for me this morning as we start. I'd like you to think back to when you were a teenager. And I, I realize that may be a bit more challenging for some of us than it used to be, but I want you to do it anyway, and if you need to close your eyes uh, to, to get this image in mind, that's, that's fine too. But if you're a woman, I want you to think back to that first big date and how you felt. How important it was to you to make sure that you looked good for that young man you were going on a date with. But if you're a man, I want you to think back to all those community ball teams and what it was like to make the best team, let's say, or, or to be put on a winning team. Now with those thoughts in mind, consider how you'd have felt had your mother suddenly said, oh, by the way, dear, I need to chaperone. Or if your father said, I'm going to be the assistant coach, how would you have responded? Would you have said something like, what? You need to chaperone? You're going to help coach? I'll be so embarrassed. Have you ever done that to your kids? Embarrass them, I mean. I mean, my wife and I did any number of times. And when they complained, we would tell them that that was a parent's prerogative to either intentionally or unintentionally embarrass their kids. Of course, that didn't always help. But then, how often didn't they embarrass us? And I, and I mention all of this because, in a manner of speaking, that's what's really going on here in our text for this morning. Peter is expressing shame, or should I say embarrassment, over what Jesus has just said is about to happen. And yet, perhaps the better question might be, who's ashamed of whom. I mean, yeah, Peter was the spokesman for the group, but weren't the rest of the disciples also questioning what Jesus had said? Better yet, were Peter and the others the ones, the ones to be ashamed? Or did our Lord have a better reason to be ashamed of them? I mean, those are, those are important questions. Especially when one considers how they had just finished stating that although some saw him as John the Baptist, or as Elijah, or one of the other prophets, they believed him to be the Christ. And yet one can't help wondering, were they defining Jesus according to divine precepts? or according to their own popular view. I mean, I have no doubt that Peter meant well when he told Jesus that that would never happen to him. After all, the last thing Peter would have wanted was for Jesus to face the shame of defeat. The last thing uh, he would have liked was to see him suffer and die. But why was that? Was it because he really didn't want Jesus to suffer? Or because of how it might make him look? I think we know the answer. And Peter wasn't alone. In fact, why do you think our Lord charged his disciples not to proclaim him 
publicly as the Messiah. Because he knew how the people would react. Remember, popular opinion back then was that the Messiah was to be a king, like David. A king who would destroy their enemies and restore the glory of the kingdom. Which is why the people weren't ready to hear the truth. I mean, they weren't any more ready to hear that than the disciples were to be told they were going to desert and abandon him. And if truth be told, you and I aren't any more ready to hear it either. After all, as, as Luther once stated, whatever one loves most is your God. And what do we love most? Money? Power? Prestige? I mean, let's face it. Our world offers some pretty tantalizing pleasures these days. And as much as we might hate to admit it, are often caught up in the thrill of the hunt, you might say, ourselves. And yet as tantalizing as all of that might be, what's more important? That or what our Savior has to offer? Again, tough questions. Because more often than not, we can't see beyond what is important or necessary for the moment. Have difficulty seeing things from an eternal perspective. Which is why we often could easily carve out our own little kingdom in this world and get lost process. Take two friends who uh, happen to be walking uh, past the tract of land, uh, for example. What do you think this land and these buildings cost me? The one, the owner of the property said to the other. I have no idea what they cost you in money, his friend replied, but based on what you just asked, I think I know what they cost you otherwise. And what might that be? The owner inquired. Your soul was a sorrowful reply. And unfortunately, that's where many are today. I mean, we put so much stock in what we have or in what we can get out of this world that we virtually sell our souls to the devil. And yet it should never be a matter of what we can get out of this world. It should never be what we can get, but what we can give. For the truth is, and our text puts it well here, if we do not spend our life for Christ, we lose it. And then what will our Lord say upon his return? I never knew you, away from me, you evildoers. But you know something? That's not the only reason that people express shame over our Lord. I mean, take the, take the acceptance or the recognition that people so often seek today. I mean, many want so much to be accepted, want, want so badly to be recognized in this world that they're literally afraid to admit that they trust in or believe in a man who died on a cross. And yet what's more important? The ridicule and rejection of friends and associates or rejection by the one whose unconditional acceptance of us leads to eternal life. You know, when Winston Churchill became prime minister during World War II, he offered the people, as he put it, nothing but blood, toil, 
tears, and sweat. Which, if you think about it, is exactly what our Lord offers us with, with one key difference. Along with all of the things that you and I might have to endure in, in this life. He's actually able to assure us of a victory. And yeah, we might lose our, our sense of, of self. But perhaps that's what we need to lose. After all, self-centeredness is, is idolatry, right? And self-fulfillment deceives us by promising that by doing what comes naturally, we can somehow find true happiness. And yet, as our Lord points out, the only way to true and lasting happiness, the only way to truly be at peace with ourselves is by surrendering to him. For to live for self means to live for the devil. While if moved by all that our Lord has done for us, we live for him, we can rest assured he'll never be ashamed of us. It's not all that unlike the story of a young man who upon meeting uh, this very wealthy individual for the first time uh, said to him, you are to be envied more than anyone I know. And why is that? The wealthy individual replied. I, I see no reason that you should envy me. What? exclaimed the young man. Why, you are a wealthy man. Just think of all the money that you bring in each month. So, the rich man replied, what, what do I get out of it? My, my food? My clothes? I can only eat so much food. can only wear one suit at a time. Even you can do that, can't you? Well, yeah. But, but what about all the fine houses you own and, and all the rental income they bring? What good does that do me? The rich man replied. I can only live in one house at a time. And as for the money, I can't eat or wear it. I can use, only use it to buy more houses for, for other people to live in. They're the ones who benefit, not me. Finally, after a, a little more back and forth, the wealthy man turned to this young man and said, you know something? One thing I've learned is the less that you desire in this life, the happier you'll be. All my wealth can't buy one more day of life, can't buy back my youth or prevent my death. Why, it won't be long before I lay down in the grave and leave all this forever. Then what will happen? You have no reason to envy me. Nor do we. Which is why even though you or I might be tempted, as, as Peter and the others were here in our text, to be ashamed of our Lord, the fact that he was willing to give up everything, including his life, should move us to not only follow him, but to live our lives as he did. And, and he was willing to give up everything. For even though he was, as Paul writes, in the form of God, he did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. In fact, being found in human form, Paul continues, he humbled himself. Yet he not only humbled himself, but he became obedient even unto death even death on the cross. How difficult then should it be for, for you or, or for me to do the same? 
After all, Jesus calls us to renounce no more of this world than he did. In fact, the Christian's entire life has but one purpose, to follow him wherever he may lead. The Christian has but one life to spend in his service. So do it. Follow him faithfully through self-denial, suffering, even death if necessary, in order that you might live with him forever. Is it going to be easy? Of course not. In fact, the only way that any of us are ever going to be able to do it or even come close is if we are daily reminded of what it really means to be a child of God, to take up our cross and, and follow him. And what better way to be reminded than by having a cross? And I know most of us have crosses hanging on our walls in our homes, but you know, we go out of our homes occasionally, even in the midst of the pandemic, right? So why not have a cross? And I can't pull it out right now, but hanging around your neck. Or what about having, carrying a cross around in your pocket? Have you ever seen those cross in your pocket? I, you know, I realize you know, that may seem rather gimmicky, and I don't know if that's even a word. But if it helps remind us of our Savior's sacrificial love, if it helps to remind us of how, instead of being ashamed, we should really be willing to take our stand with him and live our lives for him. If it helps to remind us of the need to daily be in the word, reading, studying, and taking to heart the wondrous message of God's love in Christ, that perhaps it's not such a gimmick after all. So find a cross, put it in your pocket, or better yet, put it on a chain and hang it around your neck. And may it remind you constantly of what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Amen. Now we have a special treat, I understand, this morning. So. I would invite them to come forward at this time. Still, 
Well, I stand in your presence Or to my knees will I fall Will I sing hallelujah Will I be able to speak at all I can only imagine yeah. I can only imagine I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun, I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine, yeah. I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel Will I dance for you, Jesus Or not of you be still Will I stand in your presence Or to my knees will I fall Will I sing Hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine, yeah, I can only imagine, yeah, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel when I dance for you, Jesus, or not? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees I will fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine, yeah, I can only imagine, I can only I can only imagine I can only imagine When I will, I will do Yes, forever Forever worship you I can only imagine mm -hmm. the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose and came according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. 
I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. O oh Lord, in these Lenten days, set our minds on your things rather on the, than on the things of man, that we might deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow your Son through this life into the joys of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, you have given your church the joy of proclaiming the truth that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us so that we might be justified by his blood and saved from your wrath over our sins. Grant all pastors the gifts of your spirit to preach and teach this truth boldly and faithfully and help us to confess it in word and deed throughout our daily lives. Lord, in your mercy, your Lord, keep us from being ashamed of the Son of Man when we face persecution for his name in this world. That he may not be ashamed of us when he comes in your glory with all the angels. Be near to all those who are facing martyrdom for Christ and sustain them unto the end. That they may be crowned with life before you, Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, since all kingship belongs to you and you rule over the nations. <clears throat> we pray that you would bless all those who govern us in your stead, that we may be ruled wisely and in accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And oh Lord, through your Holy Spirit, pour out your love into, into the hearts of all those who are suffering in our midst that their sufferings may produce endurance, endurance character, and character hope, that they will not be put to shame. Grant them health and healing in accord with your perfect will and sustain them in all their trials. We especially remember before you, Lord, this morning, Mary, Ken, Nancy, Terry, Jeanette, <coughs> Marge, Liesel, Bruce, Walter and Fran, Marlene, Stephen, Sam, Tracy, Leslie, and Eric. We also rejoice today with Garland and Gail, who are both celebrating birthdays or have celebrated birthdays recently. Continue to bless them throughout their lives and throughout their days. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, at your table, the afflicted eat the body and blood of your Son and are satisfied. Through our affliction, deepen our hunger for this table, that we may eat and drink and be satisfied by Christ's saving life. Lord, in your mercy, your prayer. all this and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, we pray that you would remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now may the Lord of <clears throat> peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah.